The New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital and a wonderful deli that provides it for us. So if you are, everybody, is nobody, everybody chewing? Otherwise we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would remain standing, I would like to just express our gratitude, our thank you to the uh, EMS people here in Yorktown, to our wonderful Yorktown Police Department, and of course to our veterans who we will be celebrating at the end of this month. Thank you very much. Also a moment of silence for the victims of Ukraine, of course, that we hold in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to introduce the members of the Senior Advisory, starting with Daryl. I'm Daryl Lindholm, Secretary. Jenny Minton. Rosemary Panio. Maria Fama. Joe Falcone, Recreation Liaison. Diana Quas, Town Clerk. So much, Diane, for being here today. Um, we have a wonderful speaker today, uh, Jennifer Schwartz Crawford, Westchester County Program Specialist regarding caregiving for seniors and elders. This is a wonderful thing for us all to hear about because different things happen, um, you know, in, in your life, and some of them may be long term, some of them might be short term, and we're anxious to provide a vehicle for anyone to get in touch with or call should they, their need arise in, in their families. So I'd like to present Jennifer, Jennifer Crawford. Hi everyone, it's, it's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. As always, I bring greetings from our commissioner of the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services, May Carpenter, and um, from my supervisor and executive director of Livable Communities and director of program development, Colette Phipps. Also, thank you very much to the Yorktown Senior Advisory Committee for having us, me here today. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Um, so I uh, am a program specialist at the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services and today I'm going to talk a little bit about our Livable Communities Initiative and specifically uh, one of our programs, our Caregiver Coaching Program. So we'll go to the next slide please. Thank you. So just a bit of an overview, the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services is not just a county department, but we are also an area agency on aging. We, all, we sometimes call ourselves a triple A. We, that means that we're designated by the state to serve older adults in Westchester County. And triple A, we define older adults as those who are 60 plus. There's uh, 59 triple A's in New York State, and there's over 600 in the whole country. This is a nationwide program. And in that, our mission is to identify and pri prioritize the needs of older adults in Westchester. We create comprehensive and coordinated plans for meeting those needs. And of course, we advocate for responsive policies, programs, actions, legislation, and resources on behalf of older adults. This is all under the Older Americans Act. Under the Older Americans Act, we provide mandated services uh, to older adults 60 plus and also to their caregivers as well, which we'll get into in just a moment. We can go to the next slide. Oh, that's perfect. Um, She's ahead of you. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so uh, I also like to, and, and Colette likes to share um, some demographics about Westchester County. So our 60 plus population, we have about 214,000 older adults here in Westchester County. Uh, so that, what does that mean? It means one in every five uh, Westchester County resident is 60 years of age and older. Uh, the 85 plus population is growing faster than any other cohort. And also what's interesting too is Westchester County has approximately 55,000 caregivers caring for loved ones 60 years of age and older. And when we talk about caregivers, we're talking about informal caregivers. So we're talking about family members, friends, neighbors, people like that. Um, 
Westchester County also has the highest longevity rate in New York State. It's 79.2 years. Um, and almost 80% of people 65 plus live alone are women. And we know also, too, that caregiving disproportionately affects women as well. And I'll get into some of those demographics in just a few moments. A few, a few moments. A couple of other uh, points to highlight. Over 7,000 grandparents are raising grandchildren and our poverty rate is just below uh, 10%. Uh, we could go to the next slide. So one of the things that makes our department unique, again, we're not just a county department, not just a AAA, um, we also have a not-for-profit branch called the Westchester Public-Private Partnership for Aging Services. This allows us to go for grants and to raise funds um, to enhance the programs of the department, so to even to make those services go even further. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So I'm going to start by talking about one of our caregiver support programs. Um, Colette Phipps handles the National, National Family Caregivers Grant. Um, and one of the programs that we have under our Livable Communities Unit is the Caregiver Coaching Program. You'll see here, these are the folks uh, who developed the program. It was developed with Fordham University, Ravison Center on Aging, um, and it was developed I, I believe it was in 2009, so a little over 10 years ago. If we go to the next slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the program itself. And also, in your red folders, you have a pink brochure. That brochure is directly related to the L3C Caregiver Coaching Program. So what is the Caregiver Coaching Program? It provides service delivery, so it provides services through volunteerism. And it helps those informal caregivers, so those are uh, family members, friends, neighbors, make informed decisions to meet challenges they face by providing them with trained volunteer support and guidance. So what we do, in a nutshell, is we train volunteer coaches from the community, and then we match them with caregivers in the community. And they talk by phone on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, whatever they agree upon. Um, the coaches are volunteers, they're not professionals, but they are trained quite rigorously with our curriculum. We have a very formal curriculum. It takes about two days to train our coaches. Uh, coaches go through an application process, as do our caregivers, and then based on that information, we do the match. Once the match is made, again, the caregiver will contact the, uh, I'm sorry, the coach will contact the caregiver um, by telephone and they'll set up a schedule to talk. Um, volunteer coaches, they're trained to educate caregivers. They have a pretty, very large curriculum and resource guide. So if the caregiver has questions, the coach will have that guide at their disposal to uh, give that information. Um, they are also kind of a stabilizing presence. They, um, they are a sounding board for the caregiver. Um, and some of the things that, that's important to uh, think about with this program is one of the things is, is that the coach has a very clear role. So they talk with that uh, caregiver on a weekly basis by telephone, but they don't speak with the care recipients and they don't come to the house and they don't do things errands in person. They're just there to be that support for the caregiver. They are, you know, they almost you know, they're there just for the caregiver. And, and sometimes that can be a very important thing for a caregiver who's caregiving 24-7 to have something that is their own. Um, and again, it's a general uh, kind of a stabilizing force as well in uh, a caregiver's life. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the demographics that go into caregiving and why these programs are so important. Um, I'll, I'll highlight a few of them. I won't go into it uh, uh, too, too much, but uh, just wanted to make a note of a few items here. So yeah, seven... Yeah, yeah. Went too far then. Hold on. Oh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> One more. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. So 79% of the es of estimated 53 million unpaid caregivers in the U.S. care for an adult in this group who is 50 plus. And the prevalence of those caregiving for older adults, it's increased by 7.6 million since 2015. So hmm. we know that, um, you know, our uh, 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 senior population is, is growing. Um, 
when I, I'm, a, I'm a program specialist, but I'm also a social worker and I supervise students. And um, when they come to me, sometimes they say, you know, I want to work with, with the aging population. And I say, there's no such thing as an aging population. We're all aging. <laughs> so I'm just about to use that term and I'm thinking to myself, no, Jennifer, don't. <laughs> but um, we, we, this particular cohort, we know that it's growing. Um, one in six uh, Americans now providing care to someone age 50 or older equates to nearly 42 million adults caring for someone age 50 or older. And it's uh, a trend that's only expected to persist as one of the largest demographic bo uh, groups, baby boomers, continue to age. Um, caregivers of adults age 50 or older are a diverse group. 61% are non-Hispanic white, 17% are Hispanic Latinx, 14% are African American, 5% are Asian American and Pacific Islander, uh, Islander and 3% are some other race and ethnicity. And if we just go to the next slide, the last one I want to highlight is 6 in 10 caregivers of those ages 50 or older are women, 61%, and 62% of caregivers of older adults also work with providing care. So again, just some background about why our caregiver support programs are so important. If we go to the next slide, um, caregiver coaching is one of the programs that we offer under our Livable Communities initiative. So Livable Communities is kind of the umbrella that we offer this program under. Um, it's Westchester County's signature initiative. It was the first age-friendly designation from AARP and the World Health Organization. It embraces a people helping people village model. Um, there is a focus on volunteerism. And we have six livable communities connections. So these are coordinators in different parts of Westchester County. Originally, the region was divided into nine regions. We consolidated them into six. And so we have uh, coordinators in different areas of Westchester who provide localized programming to each of those areas. So for example, and I don't know how many of you have worked with her or who know her, Deb Castle from Family Services of Westchester, Ride Connect, is the Livable Communities Coordinator for the Yorktown area. Uh, she does excellent work. She will deliver regional council meetings. Um, she does educational forums. We do a large village fair um, and, and is just a resource to the community. And, and certainly, I encourage everybody to, to reach out to her if you'd Could like Could you repeat to her name and where we can contact her? Absolutely. Um, so the Livable Communities Connections Coordinator for the Northeast Central Region of Westchester County which includes Yorktown. Her name is Deb Castle, C-A-S-I-L-L. -L. <coughs> um, her particular agency or her hub is uh, Family Services of Westchester, Ride Connect. Her phone number is 914-281-0854. Also, too, in your package, you'll find a green brochure. It has her information on there as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is just is a very busy slide, but it just uh, gives you a basic idea of our structure. You can see in the middle there our six uh, regional livable communities coordinators and the areas that they serve. They have that uh, regional council. Again, that's for folks to come to them with um, issues, concerns uh, that are localized and, and kind of plans to address it. Um, and also to incorporating education and information uh, into that as well. So to go back to, um, again, so the livable communities is the umbrella, caregiver coaching is under it. To go back to caregiver coaching, just a brief uh, history of how it was <coughs> developed. It was developed with the Fordham University Ravison Center on Aging. Um, there was a curriculum advisory commi committee and development team. It took a lot to, to put it together. Um, and then once it's, it was together, it was re we were ready to do our tr uh, trainings. So, so you, uh, what's important to understand, too, is with the volunteer uh, caregiver coaches, they don't act as professionals. They act as volunteers. But they are trained um, on a rigorous 
uh, curriculum that goes on for two days. And the curriculum is evidence-based. We have a report from Fordham University that the curriculum part of this program is evidence-based. The training prepares volunteers to be coaches to provide support and information to the caregivers. So again, they provide that social support and they also as well have that resource guide so they can give information and assistance, reliable information and assistance. When Colette and I do the training, we uh, use things like lectures, we use role play, we use simulation, we have case scenarios, so vignettes that the coach might find them, uh, a particular situation that the coach might find themselves in, and then we, we will act that out and see, you know, kind of uh, do a simulation, if you will, and then afterwards kind of give feedback so that the person feels ready. And then again, once the application process happens and we have a match, we'll pair them up and see how they go. We also have periodic caregiver conversations. These are meetings with our coaches to check in, um, to see what's going on, to give um, feedback and uh, uh, about what they're saying. Um, of course, if there's ever a red flag issue or red flag informa uh, information, uh, Colette and myself are always available to the coaches and we encourage them to be in contact with us so we can kind of step in and intervene if necessary. Um, <clears throat> we can go to the next couple of slides. We can go to replicability. Yeah, so um, what's great about uh, the L3C Caregiver Coaching Program, too, is that it's been replicated locally, nationally, and globally. And these are just a few of the places that it's been um, replicated. We did programs in uh, Long Island. We uh, did a training in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Jacksonville, Florida, Arizona. We did a, uh, worked with a couple of agencies in Michigan. Um, I believe it was replicated in a uh, small village in Portugal, and we also did a, pre a presentation to a representative of Japan. <coughs> so, um, you know, and that just kind of helps us kind of spread the word and, and, and get the word out on this program. Um, in the next slide, in March 2020, during and, and in April 2022, during the height of the COVID pandemic, this program kind of lent itself to... Um, social isolation naturally because it was remote to begin with because it was by telephone and that's what I think that that's one of the reasons why when we do replicate it um, it's of interest to places that are rural where transportation is challenging um, so because it had kind of had that remoteness built into it we uh, Colette and I kind of revised the curriculum to add COVID-19 resources. And we did a training uh, of more coaches here in Westchester County to get them paired with caregivers during COVID-19 as well. And we're, we continue to pair people um, just because, uh, you know, the isolation is, has been such, you know, is necessary, but challenging at the same time. Um, we can go to the next slide. I, for time's sake, I won't go over all of these programs, but as I said, Livable Communities is an umbrella, and these are just some of the programs that we offer. Caregiver Coaching is one of them. We also have a Care Circles of Westchester guide. It's a wonderful guide um, that we give out that uh, talks about how caregivers in the community can recognize and organize resources around them and around the care recipient. So in effect, create a care circle around the care recipient. Um, we have a chronic disease self-management program. Um, if anybody's familiar, my colleague Mary Kay Capasso coordinates that program. It's a six-week course um, where we talk about how to manage chronic conditions. Um, and we have that in five iterations, chronic disease self-management, chronic pain self-management, um, building Better Caregivers, Workforce Wellness, and Tomando Control de Su Salud, which is the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program in Spanish. Um, and again, her information is in your folders as well because um, she'll go anywhere, anywhere and everywhere to do a workshop, and they are available in person as well as virtually. Um, Again, it, we have one more. We have our map, our My Aging Plan. Again, these are booklets that talk about steps that you can take to prepare for getting older throughout the lifespan. It starts in the 20s and 30s and goes all the way up. Um, and those are available through our department as well. There's a lot of really great resources in there. Um, I want to mention, too, in terms of events, we have villages, which are community partners. 
um, who have joined our kind of village network and work with us to, to uh, bring this great programming. Um, so on, we have an in-person event coming up on um, August 11th. We have a village meet and greet. It's at Ridge Road Park in Hartsdale from 10.30 to 12.30, and my contact information is here if you'd like to come. We have the New York State AARP president coming. His name is James O'Neill. He's an excellent speaker, um, and he'll be our special guest speaker. Uh, we'll have a couple of vendors, some refreshments, and we'll enjoy each other's company in the park in August. Um, the very last two slides, uh, the, last, uh, the second to last slide is just a list of the uh, reward, uh, sorry, awards and uh, accolades that we've received. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that the Caregiver Coaching Program was featured in the 2015 Age-Friendly Report, Inspiring Communities. Um, it, was, uh, it was named one of 16 case studies from the United States and around the world and was an example of civic participation and employment and community and health services. Um, so, and again, you have the whole list there in your packets. So the last slide is just mine and Colette's contact information. Um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Anybody has them? I have uh, cards with me if anybody would like to call me or send an email. Um, but otherwise, there is information in your packets. I also want to just very quickly say too that the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services is here to answer your questions and to, to address anything that you may need. Their phone number is 914-813-6300. The department uh, provides information and assistance. We have over 130 subcontractors. We uh, have our nutrition department, which does uh, nutrition centers as well as home delivered meals. We have over 130 subcontractors providing various services in Westchester County, and we have case management. So again, 914-813-6300. Thank you. He has a question. Um, are you in the hospitals? Because caretaking sometimes starts with an emergency. Uh, the person's at the hospital, the wife or the husband is there. And uh, is there a social worker in the hospital aware and, and informative about this? Because um, being a caretaker, you don't stand up and say, I'm a caretaker, you're caretaking. And yeah. it's, uh, if the social worker is the first person that you uh, encounter in the situation, because you've got Medicare to take care of, and, and what happens when you go home, and those things that the hospital actually interfaces with. But after the hospital interface, it's over. There's nobody there. And, and I've called churches, I've called um, you know, local community uh, groups. And um, uh, of course, this was well before 2015. Okay, this was well before 2015. But now, is there someone who goes to the hospital from your organization to say, uh, this person's going to need additional care. Who's going to do that? How uh, is it the family member? And these are resources for the family member. That's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so the question was, is um, what is our presence in hospitals? So um, I can say this. So uh, we and my supervisor in particular, has worked with several area hospitals to let folks know about the programs that we offer. Some hospitals, too, have caregiver centers um, as well, and, and, and they're, part, they're part of the hospital. Um, and we have, again, worked with several hospitals to let them know that we're here. Um, I have gotten some emails like from discharge planners to know about these programs as well. I know um, one senior center in particular I'm thinking of um, also would be part of some discharge plans and notice that as well. So, but that being said, it is hard to get the word out. Um, we do have resource centers in the libraries as well. Mm -hmm. And as, as much as we really do, we, we try to get the word out. You're right. It's, it's, it's challenging. It's challenging. And I can't say that everybody who goes to the hospital necessarily knows. I'm not saying that you're not actively oh, sure. you know, seeking caregivers. I'm saying for caregivers, this, you can't be so involved in the caregiving that you, gee, 
you got to go to the library. I mean, it's yeah. you know it's absolutely thing. true. Could I, I could I make a comment on that? Um, we recently had the experience, as you know, with my dear husband, who, thank God, is sitting here. Um, it, it seems to me as though the hospitals or the individual physicians are making that connection now as well. Because, he, for instance, we had oh, I would, three, four people come to our house, one to see if he was able to walk up and down the stairs, uh, one to see whether he could get in and out of bed, well, all the, well, we had three or four people actually come to our home afterwards. Were they, they were very, they were from the hospital, mm -hmm. sent from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very polite, very, very competent, well-trained. And it was a very brief visit. Each one was very brief. They just had to check on a certain situation. Mm -hmm. And they were actually uh, sent from the doctors at the hospital. General, GP, um, the person that, that took him. Yeah, when he, uh, you know, when we took him into the emergency room, he had issues that the, the neurologist, I'm sorry, the neurosurgeon wanted to be sure to check up on certain things, so he sent someone. So this, this I thought, was a wonderful thing. I didn't even know they were coming, frankly. They just rang the doorbell and, say, and, and said, and showed me their credentials. And for those people, then you were able to find a caregiver if you needed one. Well, yeah, uh, but, but the doctors wanted to be sure that after they sent them home that they were on the right track, that they were, that they were doing better, that they could do this so they could not do that. Otherwise, I, I would imagine they would have followed through. Uh, like I said uh, to Jennifer, my issue was well before 2015, uh, and there was uh, the doctors sent therapists and people to advise me and, uh, and my husband on the household. But after that, it was up to me to get to meetings at the hospital of caregivers or, or right. whatever was available. It was difficult back then. I have, to, I have to... This is much better yeah. now. I just want to interrupt a little bit. I have to agree with you because I also had a slight... Well, since like October, November is still going on. We did get services from the hospital but that was the end of it. Nobody ever, I, in fact, this is what brought this meeting about. I was not aware of Westchester County, and I brought it up here because I personally, and I'm not embarrassed to say it, needed it. <clears throat> I had gotten into a very depressed state because of the caregiving that I was doing, which is not like me, but it happens. We don't know, but luckily I knew it was happening, and I reached out to Daryl here, and she said, that they do have, some, which I was not aware of it. Nobody in my family was aware of it. And again, the hospital was great with their follow-up and sending people. But once they found that you were okay, that was the end of it. But I personally needed more attention. And I think we have this problem with everything, communication. Fortunately, I was in a little different situation because I was able to reach out to the veterans Actually, they reached out to me because I had to cancel some appointments, and they wondered why. So it progressed from there, and they now come to the house to visit him. But as far as your programs, myself, my family, and many of my friends were not aware of the services that we have. And we do have a problem with communication in everything. Communicating is very, very difficult, and we do have, and that's why we have you here today, hopefully to communicate and everybody tell everybody else that there are services to help us, because they really are needed, because caretakers, as you could see from the statistics, it's unbelievable because we are living so much longer, yeah. and they're really needed. I am so, so happy to know. Thanks to Daryl, she was yeah, able. Was well, wonderful. let me let me just say, Rosemary said, you know, the 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 hospitals and the professionals come in and for a certain amount of time. You're talking long term, right. and that's what the coaching problem program is all about. Long term, you know, not years perhaps, but maybe months, maybe several months, maybe even only a month. It depends entirely on the person that's doing the caregiving. She may say, he or she may say, well, it's taken care of, I'm okay, I no longer need to talk with you, or that you can tell they may go on and on. So that's what this program is. It is a great program. Yep. And um, uh, a view of perhaps easing the caregiving 
caregivers uh, concerns, worries, and what they can do and what they can't do. Unfortunately, everybody that I met would say, hey, how's Tony doing? <laughs> right, but what about He's me? He's doing fine. <laughs> Why shouldn't he? He sleeps, he eats, he's taken care of. I said, hello, yeah. how about me? You know, but it, it's life. I mean, they don't think. They want to know how the sick person is. They don't realize that there's a daughter or a son or a wife or a mother or somebody that's letting him look like that and feel like that and get better. And I am so, so happy that we're able to have you come. Yeah. And I'm hoping that we've reached enough people and that you will broadcast this a little bit. Uh, it is on TV. Uh, you can watch the program on TV again. Our, our meetings are publicized. And we've had such great meetings, and this is one of our important ones. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And, Thank you. and we want to hear from you because we're, we're going to, we try to match circumstances with whatever is available out there and we are living longer uh, not perfectly but we are living longer and uh, we do have some issues from time to time and we want all of our seniors to know I we can't guarantee those of us up here that we can you know rectify whatever situation you have but we're willing to inform you inform ourselves and reach out there so that a lot of this stuff, who knew about it? I mean, you know, it's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing, and it's, we're very thankful. Thank you. It's true, and I wanted to uh, just acknowledge, too, you're absolutely right. A lot of uh, family caregivers, they don't identify as caregivers. They just say, I'm family. That's what you do. Yes. Yes. And, and, yes, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely Are true. Are there any other questions out there? Raise your hands. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you much. very much. Thank you. Okay, who's next on our agenda? Let me see. Dave. Um, Dave. I have a feeling it's Dave Paganelli. Dave, Dave, Dave. Yeah, Mr. Slater, <laughs> our supervisor, could not be here. His grandmother, unfortunately, had uh, need of him today, so I don't know how that worked out. And but Dave Paganelli is here, our highway a superintendent. <laughs> no, not at all. An equal substitute. Thank you, Dave. Poor substitute, indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Dave in his red shirt. <laughs> so I've sort of been thrown into this, and um, I've got Tommy telling me one thing. I'm supposed to be telling you what's going on in the town. And certainly I could tell you what's going on in every road in the town. Um, that being said, um, what did he say I should mention? I should mention that last evening we had our new residents welcoming first meeting, and that was a big success, went very nicely. Um, he said I should mention that there are a lot of publications available at the back of the boardroom when people want to come in, park scheduling, all these different things that, you know, you could make yourself, you could avail yourself of. So that's basically, Tommy, did I get everything you asked me to say? Good, <laughs> wonderful. So I'll talk about roads, all right, which will be a lot easier for me. So right now, um, highway is getting prepared to start paving roads. Um, that being said, we're basically going off the list that I had created two years ago when I went out and raided every single road in town. It's available on our website at, you know, our, the town website, yorktowny.org, and you click on highway and it'll say road ratings and pulls it up alphabetically by your road and you could see where your road stands compared to the other 12 million roads that we have. Wow. So that being said, I think it's very helpful that when we pick these roads, you understand that there is a mechanism in place. I'm not just saying, hey, my cousin lives on that road. I think I'll pave that, you know? So, <laughs> so that's, that's the reason I did this. Um, the way the roads are rated is not strictly on, on condition. It has to do with average speed on the roads. Are the roads prone to accidents? You know, what, what would the road benefit from? Could the road actually be better off left alone to the point where it needs to be reclamated, which means you go in there, you grind it all up, it goes into this big train, they add liquid asphalt, and it goes right back down on the road. Sometimes the roads are too far gone and you need like a five inch reclamation. So that's part and parcel of it. We are also trying to mill roads. That What's been happening in Yorktown forever <clears throat> is we overlay roads. Okay, we go out there, we put 
two inches of asphalt on, and then we go back in eight, ten years and put another two inches of asphalt on. And the perfect example is right here on Underhill. If you go across 118 on Underhill, look to the left, <coughs> hot basins, the spot for the water is like that thick. It's supposed to be like that thick, where the water comes down and goes in. So overlaying roads forever is not a good plan. So we started two years ago milling roads, which means you go out there, you mill them, again, with this machine that grinds them up. You know, I like to use my hands. I'm kind of Italian, but I'm half Irish, so that's a good thing. <laughs> then we overlay the roads into the milling. So the road never ends up higher than it was before. So that's the perfect way to do roads. Unfortunately, that adds 33 to 35% to the cost of doing a road. Mm. Like the first road that we actually milled was Quinlan Street when um, – Senator Murphy had gotten us a $250,000 grant for that. So that was our first experiment with milling. And last year, I believe we milled Heathercrest, um, Meadowcrest, Moreland, um, that whole neighborhood, Barbary on the other side. And we're trying to do neighborhoods rather than willy-nilly. You know, there's nothing worse than if you're in the middle of a neighborhood and you're on, your road gets paved and you're like, oh, this is wonderful. I'm driving along and boom, you know, you're, you're, you're in Beirut, you know, which is not a good thing. So we're trying to work our way into neighborhoods, complete entire neighborhoods to get from, from our roads to state roads. Now, people often ask, what are state roads? Anything with a number associated is a road that Yorktown Highway does not maintain. 129, 134, Route 6, Route 202. 118. Those are all state roads. And we get a lot of calls and we'll always refer them to the right agency to speak to. So the good news <coughs> is um, funding has remained relatively stable. And in addition to which, we've um, received another $86,000 this year from the state. A lot of our funding comes from the state. Town board has been awesome. Every year they increase the paving budget by $50,000 which is great. When I, when I got here, we had like 200,000. Now we have a million too, which is wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it seems like a lot, right? But to pave a mile of road <coughs> and mill it is about $200,000. And we have 200 miles of road. So, you know, so our, our hope is to get under 20 years replacement cycle, you know, where every 20 years the roads will be done. The new catch in that is because of what's going on with the price of fuel, as you can see, when we go out to bid, a company comes in and does this paving for us. When we go out to bid on this paving, we have to tie it to some sort of an index because no one's going to say, hey, two years from now, I'm going to give you that for $90 a ton laid in place. So that being said, we tie it to the liquid asphalt index. So to give you an idea, in February, I believe the liquid asphalt index was 280 and right now it's 630 Ooh. so even though it's only a partial percentage of what the asphalt cost last year we were paying 92 dollars a ton laid in place that means they come and do it and this year that if we're going to start next week it's at 108 a ton so that right there you could see that we can we can't do another we it's almost 18 percent what's that thank you Joe. <laughs> thank you Joe. <laughs> i'm not gonna go there um the other part is right now our asphalt isn't a great quality because the federal government insists that the that the the as, the asphalt plants put a certain amount of wrap in there RAP and this is insider talk so you guys are going to leave with some great knowledge you can say ah oh, that's because there's wrap in there <laughs> so wrap is basically recycled asphalt product. When you see, when we mill the roads, they'll take that, throw that old road in with the new asphalt. They'll take tires, grind them up really fine, throw them in with the new asphalt. They'll take roofing shingles, scrunch them up really fine, throw them in with the new asphalt. So now you have asphalt that used to last 15 years, even in the Northeast, you'll be lucky to get 8 to 10. So we're in a crunch. So the cost is going up, the longevity is going down. So that's sort of what we're doing. We're doing the best we can, you know, without, you know, and people real, you know, people call me up and they're like, well, I pay my taxes. I say, well, everyone pays their taxes, you know. <laughs> you know. Deduction for recycling? No, no. When I first went up to Cornell for highway school, they had a thing called warm mix, okay, which was instead of hot asphalt, it was warm asphalt, 
Okay, and I listened to, it was like a three-hour class. So I listened to the whole class. And at the end, the person said questions. And I said, yeah. And I said, what's the cost? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, is it cheaper than hot mix? Oh, no, it's a little more expensive. I said, let me understand this. You want me to use a product that may not work as well. I said, what is the upside for my town? And the person said, well, you could call yourself the green highway superintendent. I said, I'd rather be the red highway superintendent. I'm good with that. You know, so there's, there's a, it's, it's an ever-evolving scenario. So, and that's where we're at now. We're going to start paving. Um, we'll do some things that people probably will think is odd. Um, oftentimes, I'll give you a perfect for instance. We're planning on paving part of East Main Street up in Mohegan and Shrub Oak, basically from from Sagamore, all right, out to Stony Street. And people are going to say, well, why don't you do the whole thing? You know, well, because if I spent $550,000 up there doing that, I would have spent a third of the budget in on one road. The other consideration is always Yorktown has a lot of hamlets. You know, as they said in The Godfather, everybody needs to wet their beak a little bit. So that being said, you know, when I lay it out, I get all my roads and then I have a map and I'm like, okay, I've got to do something in Jefferson Valley. I've got to do something in Shrub Oak. I've got to do something in Mohegan. I've got to do something on the southern end. I've got to do something in the Heights. You know, so if I spend all the money in the Heights, the people on the north end figure they're the redheaded stepchildren and that's not a good thing, you know. So um, I guess that's pretty much it. Greenwood Street. Oh, the voice. The, pay no attention to the man behind, behind the, the curtain, curtain over there. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you want me to say about Greenwood Street? Greenwood Street is scheduled to be paved this year. Um, oh, my, my, my recycling yard? Oh, okay. We're going to talk about my... Thank God I have a coach. Um, 2200 Greenwood Street. I don't know if many of you residents out there know we have a wonderful recycling facility there. You can get free mulch, free leaf mulch, which is like $40 a yard. You can get free topsoil. We have stones if you want to build a wall. We have, of course, millings. That if you needed to fill in, like you say, your driveway was... You know, millings are pretty good because you could fill in like a like you know, a little puddle in your driveway, fill it in, you stomp it down and drive over it, and then when the weather gets warm, it basically becomes asphalt again. So it's um, open Monday through Saturday from 7.30 to 2.45. You could have told me this before. I would have done better. But yeah, it's a great facility. Um, we actually – do we have a video on that somewhere, Tom? On the town website, would it be? I'm sorry. I'm asking the man behind the curtain. Okay, so on the town website, we have some various videos that we've done. One was with respect to paving. One was with respect to the um, what we affectionately call the hill, 2200 Greenwood Street. Um, one was about catch basins, you know, like the catch basins on the side of the road. So just a real quick tutorial. The catch basins are on the side of the road, and they have those backs that go across them, and that's what we were talking about on Underhill. And the sewer manholes are in the center of the road. They're the round ones. So if you notice, there are sometimes holes by the catch basins. That's basically because that case catch basin needs to be rebuilt. And we're, we're doing pretty well. There are 5,800 of those little devils in Yorktown. So, you know, and they're deteriorating rapidly. But we had, we had ordered a brand new truck three years ago with a crane and everything. So we're able, where we were, used to take us do two a day, we're able to do like four a day. So that's been very good, and less chance that somebody's going to get hurt because the, when you do a catch basin, you got to pull the frame and the um, the frame and the entire thing out and the grate and put it off to the side, and then you've got to dig it down to where it's solid. You know, it starts deteriorating from salt and what have you. So, anything else, Tom? <laughs> you have somebody's hand up back there. Raise your hand. Jim, do you have a question? Right there in the back. Uh, is there a number that the uh, seniors can call if they have any questions regarding Yes, cars? absolutely. 962-5781. That's highway. You can call and speak to the lovely Ann, all right, who does a fabulous job. She, if she can't help you, she'll send you where you need to be. <laughs> so. I think we had a hand out over Lucia. here, too. Raise your hand. What about sidewalks? What mm, about them? Good for you. So actually, currently, it's funny you should ask, currently I'm doing a sidewalk inventory. Now... Let me tell you my feeling on sidewalks. Asphalt sidewalks, okay, that were allowed to occur in this town 
are an abomination. Yep. Yes. Okay, they yeah. really are. They have no longevity. It's the cheapest way to let the developer build. Quickly. All right, I'm not a big fan of that. If it was up to me, any sidewalks the town would take would be concrete. If you look at the sidewalks up on East Main Street by the library, okay, they're, they're you know, there are a couple of trip edges, but that's because of those beautiful trees, the roots are raising the sidewalks. So now the only solution is cut all those trees down, and that's like something out of Courier and Ives. Mm -hmm. So you certainly don't want to do that. But look at those, how they've survived compared to these, pardon my language, these stupid asphalt sidewalks all over town. Hate them. You know? But yeah. so I am currently doing an inventory. I'd be curious. My guess is we probably have about 100 miles of sidewalk. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I'm... You know, as I as I drive around to have well, Kia Street. Kia, where? She yeah. can't Kia? Yeah. That's a concrete sidewalk. Yeah, but they, they, they have, uh, Look at the curb on Downing. Yeah. You wanna see an abomination? The reason let me tell you, Downing Downing Drive, this year we're going to pay Veterans Road. All right. Last year I was going to pay Veterans Road and Downing. And I'm holding off on Downing specifically because it would be like putting lipstick on a pig because those, those curbs are so hideous, all right, that if I paved that road, I look like I have a half a brain. And I know I have three-quarters of a brain. So that being said, and the other thing that was very upsetting to me, and as your elected highway superintendent, I always try to watch out for the town. The taxpayers are my, my – that's my bottom line. And I was getting a lot of pressure to put a bicycle lane on – Downing from Railroad Park out to 118, and then people would go across 118 into that new trail that's been built, and then come out by French Hill and go into FDR. If I were to put a bike path there, a trail, a bike lane, all right, and they get out to 118, there is no safe passage there. There is no. A fellow just got severely hurt down on 129, 118 two days ago, coming by where the trestle is coming out, and instead of going waiting to go straight across he was in a hurry and he he came out and he went to the left going towards nadine's and then cut across there and got hit you know and you think here people are doing 50 miles an hour on 118 yeah, there's no safe passage there so you know in my own self-interest i haven't paved it for two reasons that the curb and and the fact that i don't want to create that issue because i'll be the guy in court dave they won't even put any signals up there. Matt and I have met with the gentleman who was head of the DOT, all right, uh, Lance McMillan, I think his name was, and we had met with him on two occasions with the request that they would provide at least some flashing lights, do a crosswalk there. They have no interest. You know, no, no, the state, they they don't, they, they, they worry about their stuff. They don't want to spend a hundred thousand dollars putting, you know, a traffic light's one hundred seventy-eight thousand dollars. You know, they don't want to spend that, so our bicyclists can go across their road. You know, so. Dave, excuse me, but that young lady in the back. Yes. That talked to you about sidewalks. God bless her. She's a very young young lady, and she walks all over Creation with her little walker. She just walked here today because. She couldn't get a ride. God bless her. You could have called. Oh, she could I'm have out called. and around every day. Oh, she did. I don't know. If you want to climb up into my truck? I have trouble getting oh, up there. Oh, she can do my, that. With trust my me. knee and my hip. <laughs> no, no. Trust me. She can do it. She gets in and out of my pilot before I do. Really? Oh, yeah. But no, the sidewalks, the sidewalks are a big issue. So I think that, you know, we've never really had a plan to maintain sidewalks. That's why I figure I rate them all. And... Got me. Way before me. I'm 67 years old. There wasn't a lot of way before me. <laughs> How much way before me was there? <laughs> Columbus brought them over. Where exactly? But like by where the restaurant is? No, Keir Street. Up towards where 118 is? Yes. yes. Yes, I remember that. There was one on the right side That's by the right. sign. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not there anymore? No. Oh. No. Jim? 
<laughs> Got any benches laying around? Huh? <laughs> I got Jim Mortarano from Parks here. He's the king of benches. You know, I figure if we could squeeze a couple of benches out of him, we'll put them over there. Well, I think that would be a good spot. Yes, and especially the people from Beaver Ridge. They come across. It'd be That's a great right. space spot to stop and rest before you hit that long drag strip. Look at it. Right. I will work on it. No, I will. It's, it's, I don't know why they were taken down. Um, I'm not sure if they were on. We ma we maintain that sidewalk during the winter all the way up to Burger King. We have to plow that sidewalk. You know, it's an interesting thing that, and a lot of people don't realize this, state or county roads, all right, fall the maintenance alongside of them. Like a perfect example, that sidewalk they built from Lowe's down to BJ's, all right, right side, six-foot fence on one side, box guardrail on the other side. We have to clear that for snow. Mm -hmm. So I had to go out and spend $3,500 on a snowblower that had the capability of throwing snow six feet up in the air and over this giant fence. So, you know, but that's the law. The law is they can build all these silly sidewalks to nowhere and we have to maintain them, you know. Theoretically. So you have to plow them? We don't plow those for some reason or other. No, we don't plow them, but we go out, we'll cut them, you know, like when it gets overgrown there. We have to mow them as well. You know, that's, that's the other part of it. You know, and Highway that really doesn't do a lot of mowing. Jim does a lot of mowing. You know, so, but yes, anything by law, anything that's adjacent to a state highway falls on the municipality in which that highway is located. Ah, aha. Uh -huh. The question was, well, what about the sidewalks in front of people's homes? They have to maintain. The, the side now, that's a very interesting question <laughs> um, because every municipality is different. For instance, in White Plains, okay, and in Yonkers, the sidewalks in front of people's homes, they are responsible for repair, not just our code reads that you are responsible for keeping your sidewalk free of debris, litter and snow and ice okay so in front of your house basically it's your responsibility somebody somebody called me today and we were looking at um up on the north end somebody was blowing all their grass onto the road easier to blow it on the road you know but then we just sent our sweeper through that it took us six years to get and now all of a sudden the grass is all in the road mm -hmm. so then what we try to do is we send them out a notice of violation and say Please keep your grass off our road. Prime example, sidewalk on London Road, okay? On London Road, the bushes from the houses on, I forget which court it is, off of Brender, but there are huge bushes. I got pictures of it here because I take pictures of everything. Um, that Those bushes are blocking people from being able to use that path. That path is narrow to begin with. They're walking their dogs there. And so I was, my guys were out there. I said, brush back all that stuff. And they came back, and I went out and said, well, what, you didn't see the bushes in the road? And they said, Dave, if we cut those bushes, the person would have had no privacy. So then I call code enforcement. I say, send them the picture, and I say, please ask this person to cut their bushes back off the sidewalk. All right? And if they don't, we will. And if we will, they'll die, period. You know what I mean? Because we don't do neat. You know, <laughs> highway does that. We do, we do the heavy lifting. You know, it's like, right, Jim? We don't do neat. <laughs> um, you know, you want something that like, weighs 20 tons moved? We can do that. You want that, that bush to look like a topiary? Not happening. <laughs> so, anything else? Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Dave, thank, thank you. You, you do the best you can. Thank you so much. I hope I, hope I didn't disappoint you. The other guy is much better looking at And younger. <laughs> and way younger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, and we hope that Matt's uh, grandmother is, is doing well. Uh, our next guest speaker is James Maharano. I'm sure you all know uh, James, Jim, and uh, he's going to talk to us about creation. Is that the most yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll be brief, but uh, thank you again for having me.
Uh, we have uh, just a few things going on here. Uh, we have rec signups for seniors going on right now. Uh, our pool signups are active. So remember, uh, all seniors 60 to 64 get a $30 pool pass, unlimited uses of both pool facilities, uh, as well as 65 to 69 year olds. That's only $15, and 70 and above is a free pool pass. So uh, just come to 176 Granite Springs. Granite Springs Avenue and uh, come get your pass uh, today or, or Saturday we're open 1030 to 2 uh, or extended hours on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 6 to 8 so please come get your pool pass as soon as you can uh, we also have some fitness and exercise classes for seniors as well so you can also sign up for those classes when you come get your pool pass um, did want to talk to you guys a little bit about senior clubs here in town uh, we have many senior clubs uh, Shrub Oak meets on Mondays at 10 o'clock. Uh, Chapter 1 Seniors meets on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock. And AARP Seniors meets at the YCC as well. And they meet uh, on the second Wednesday of each month uh, at 2 o'clock. Um, I know sh the Chapter 1 Seniors is actively looking for new members. So a lot of other groups might put you on a waiting list. The Chapter 1 Senior Group will bring you on right away. Uh, you can go there for a month for, without paying any dues and see if you like it, if it's for you. Uh, so please check them out Tuesdays, 10 o'clock. That's Chapter 1 Seniors. Speaking of Chapter 1 Seniors, they're actually hosting a trip. They're going to World's Resorts Casino. Uh, that's going to be on June 28th. So if you wanted to sign up for that, um, that trip specifically, you can call my office and I can get you the appropriate paperwork. That's 914-245-4650, uh, extension 0. Uh, I'll repeat that, 914-245-4650, extension 0. And then we have another trip hosted by the Shrub Oak Seniors. Uh, they'll get first uh, chance to sign up for that trip, but later in the month of June, uh, you'll be able to sign up for their trip, which is going to be on uh, July 19th, and they're going to Author Avenue and uh, the Lobster House at City Island. So come June, you can call the office at the same number, and if there's more spot, sp space in that trip, you'll be able to sign up for that trip as well. Um, any questions out there? I have a question, Jim. Yes. I'm just curious. Curious. Why do we have two, two different chapter senior clubs? Aren't why I think the town actually has five. Uh, no, no, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Chapter 1 no longer exists, unfortunately. Oh, I thought you said that. I apologize. No, it's Shrub Oak Seniors, and uh, it's Okay, I thought, yeah, yeah. Chapter Seniors is called Chapter yeah. 1, traditionally. Uh, I guess we could drop the Chapter 1 yeah, on this. Yeah, please do, because it's confusing me. It, it could just me. be called the Yorktown Senior Club at this yeah. point. Yeah. But traditionally, it has always been called Chapter 1 because there was also a Chapter 2. Yes. But unfortunately, uh, I think over the past five okay. years ago, yeah. uh, Chapter 2. Uh, well, that's what I figured. That's why I asked. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. L uh, maybe I'll ask them to drop the chapter off their name. No, that's okay, as long as you, you clarify yes, no, Thanks for clarifying that as well. Uh, any other questions in the crowd? All right, well, hopefully, Yes. Mahjong Club, yeah, like, like I said, we've, I think we spoke before about Mahjong Club. Uh, we're certainly looking for an instructor to uh, lead that class. Uh, we'll need that to uh, create that Mahjong Club uh, and the, the appropriate time and space uh, to do that as well. Great. Depending on when you need an instructor, you know, yeah. that might be a Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be lovely. Noreen was here earlier. Yes. Uh, do we want to say a few words about the Nutrition Center? Uh, did she speak or no? No, she didn't speak. She just ca came to our executive session. But okay. we, we, we we're interested in making people aware of what's available to them there. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you go, if you want to say a few words about that. Yeah, I, like uh, Dave was saying about our website, yourtowny.org. Uh, and then if you look in nutrition specifically, uh, they do Meals on Wheels. They do meals in-house at the YCC. And they also do uh, different, uh, different fitness uh, classes as well that get uh, sponsorship through the county um, for free. Uh, so that's certainly something you want to look into. Uh, if you want to call my office again, I can forward you to Noreen. Uh, once again, 914-245-4650. Uh, it's certainly a service that is worthwhile uh, for any senior, anyone over the age of uh, 60, uh, the, especially seniors that are living alone. Uh, it's a great service and, and something that you should definitely take advantage of. Is that in our parks and recreation? Yep. Uh, there is. In the booklet, it should have some details about nutrition. Uh, but their, their specific portion of the website has more details on, on what they do. But we can certainly point you in the right direction. I yeah. think what we want to make our seniors understand that 
yes, while it's someplace that you could go to to have a meal, that's not all you can do there. You can socialize, you can go with your friends, you can meet there. And it's a, a yeah, I mean, there's, it's a wonderful <coughs> thing. Yeah, they wonderful. do special events uh, for the holidays as well. They'll have a DJ there and, yeah. and all sorts of fun stuff. So it's definitely worth getting they into. Do, they, do, <coughs> they do have to make reservations, though, if they're going to go for lunch. Correct. Yeah. Um, they do need to make reservations. That's why you want to call her directly. Mm-hmm. You have her number by it? Let me I, was, I was actually looking it up as a... Noreen was here earlier. She was going to speak, but unfortunately she was short-staffed today. So she had to go back and, and help them out. Here we go. Here we go. All right, so Noreen's number at Nutrition Office is 914-962-7447. Once again, 914-962-7447. Good. So if you want to get together with your friends and and you want to meet down there, uh, it's a wonderful place. I mean, we went a a number of times, and it's that one whole group of women was meeting there. They told me they meet there all the time. And the food is actually very good and made fresh on site every day. A lot of people don't know that either. He's a renowned chef. Yeah. People think it's just like box food or microwave dinners. This is fresh, good lunches. Yeah, it, it's it's a great program. They also cook for Somers. Yes. And another town, I don't remember. Cortland. Is it Cortland as well? Yeah. Cortland. 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 Okay. Yeah. So our neighboring towns uh, want our food as well. So anytime you want to meet with your friends and uh, you don't have a place to go, just uh, call Noreen and uh, you can go there. It's wonderful. We had a great time. Yeah, pl- please utilize the services. The services Very clean. don't feel like you're going to be hurting us by asking for it. We're here for you. We're here to serve you. Uh, so please don't be shy. Please sign up. It actually actually helps us more if you do enroll because that's more more money that comes to us with, with more enrollment. So uh, please uh, g- give Noreen a call and sign up. And once again, 914-962-7447. Especially for, for seniors and elders who are living alone. Yes. Uh, they should really feel very comfortable there. So we, we want to spread the word. And if you do know anyone, you and you're ne- yeah, and yeah, if you, you do should, know anyone, yeah. you should... Uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's Pass it along. Yes. Yeah. yeah and I, 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 love, I love the option too. If you want to socialize, they'll come pick you up. But if you don't want to socialize, they'll bring the bus and bring the food to you. So it's, it's a win win either way. Wonderful thing. Yes. There are a lot of opportunities. Right. Go and have lunch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But make sure you call. Make sure you call and make a reservation, though. <laughs> yep. Right. But you do, you do have to reserve, as yeah, Janet just said. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Good. We, we usually tell them in the morning because we go to a dance class in the gym. So we tell them, you know, we're going to come for lunch. She right. That's so, yeah. wonderful. So we go to the dance class, and then we go to lunch. Beautiful. And then we come again. It's a great day. <laughs> yeah. But what she's saying, if you can't hear at home, she does, she does a dance class. Then she gets lunch and then she's able to come home. It's perfect. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jim, she has a question. If you or anybody on the panel knows, um, the other day at St. Pat's they gave out a website to call if you wanted the COVID tests. They were giving them away. And I don't remember what it is. Somebody told me it was COVID.gov and it just doesn't work. Well, I know they were they were also giving them out at the town hall here also. I don't know if they've stopped. I picked up two from town hall. If you go upstairs to Matt's office, I don't know if they're out of them by now, but I've picked them up here and also picked up some masks here. Okay. So there are questions? many places. Uh, your COVID tests also, I know when I was at ACME <laughs> the other day, they were giving them out at ACME also. There and see there are different places when you go to Acme or CVS to their place where they t- just ask yes, if they have right. it they'll give to you. you know, I bought one. I, I bought sixteen dollars. It cost me at a pharmacy. Yeah, well, you don't have to do that. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Also, with that, uh, I got a tip the other day. USPS.com yes. uh, is giving out free COVID tests as well. So if you go to USPS.com, look up free COVID tests. I think right. they give you. Uh, quite a number of them actually for free as well it's eight now it's eight now thank you even if you google you know if your grandchildren i know a lot of people say well i'm not on the computer but we do have children or grandchildren or friend tell them to google 
Yep. Uh, that, and it'll give you, uh, you shouldn't have to pay for them. You really shouldn't have to do that. Address than theirs. Right. They can order from their same, you know, um, computer or, or, or cell phone. But it has to be going to different different address. Different address, address right. But that, like I've ordered, I ordered from my mom mm -hmm. and my sister and my brother. And yeah, I, right. I, you right. Know, everyone who needs it, I just go on and they will do it. Yeah. Yep. You just can't, none of it can come to your address. I haven't. I haven't paid for one yet. I've gotten. You can also sign up address. for booster shots uh, via the town website, yourtownny.org. Just scroll down, and there's a, a quick link to uh, sign up for booster shots right. for you and any, any family member. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, that's it for us today. We look forward to seeing you. Our next meeting is June 17th right here at Town Hall. So we look forward to seeing you then. Get your, your questions ready for us. Thank you very much.